Okay, as we continue our journey through these topics of leadership behaviors, the next place we're going to stop on our journey is activating passion. This is the role of the inspirer. And I just want to share with you very personally that 10 years ago, I could not have stood up here and talked about inspiration with any real genuineness or credibility. Because if I was honest, especially looking at the professional part of my life, I liked my job. You know, I, I stayed with the same company for 30 years for a reason. So I liked my job. But I would not have said that I was really inspired by what I did. But I, I want to share with you that over the last 10 years, and I'll, I'll share some highlights along the way here, but over the last 10 years, I feel like I really have reached the point where I can say that I am genuinely inspired by what I do. That was towards the end of my Procter & Gamble career and on into the nonprofit work that I do now. So I, in a, in a way, I feel like I've, I've been to the top of the mountain. You know, I, I know what this looks like, and it is powerful. And so what I want to relate to you is really two things. I want you to be looking through two lenses as I share about this. One of those lenses is, what can I do to more effectively inspire others and unleash this power in them? But the other thing I want you to be considering is, am I inspired? And what, what can I do to be more inspired myself? We're never going to inspire others if we're not inspired ourselves, okay? So let me start here with another quote from John Kennedy. I am not a member of the John F. Kennedy fan club, okay? <laughs> it may seem like it. <laughs> he said, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. You've heard that before, I assume? Yeah, many times. So Kennedy, uh, what he was really getting at was one of the, the first and most important points I want to make on inspiration, which is nobody is ever inspired when it's all about, no one's ever inspiring when they make it all about themselves, or even when they make it all about you. Or you, but when I make it about our collective, a collective benefit, when it rises to that level beyond self to a higher level, that's when it becomes inspiring. I love this quote from our friend Dante from many centuries ago, and this is actually the reason that we call this this area activate passion. So from the little spark may burst a mighty flame. For each one of us in this room. For every person on this planet, all of us were created to be people of passion. That passion is inside all of us. And our job as leaders and as humans, our, our job is to, is to find those passions within ourselves and within others and fan those sparks into a mighty flame. All right, so inspiration, making a spark a flame. I'm going to explain five specific points here on how you can do that. So the first one is dreaming big. We've already talked about that a bit. Explaining why, building hope, showing care, placing trust. We'll go through these one at a time. Does anybody know where this is? Sorry, can you no? uh, just uh, go, back. go back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Just take picture. Yeah, yeah, no problem. <laughs> Should I, should I smile? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to photo bomb. <laughs> All right. So, uh, anybody know where this is? Any guesses? No. This is a. I've actually been on this very space. I, I took a picture. This is not that picture, but I took a picture of my son on that very hill right there. This is in uh, the north of Norway. It's just past the Arctic Circle in a place called the Lofoten Islands. I highly recommend that you put that on your travel bucket list. It's a good place to dream because you can see so much. And uh, so our first step here is if you want to be an inspirer, you need to be somebody who is willing to dream, and not just dream, but dream big. So I told you that I worked uh, for P&G, which is this huge company, and there were many years during my career that my business objective for my business unit was to grow by 
3%. Are you inspired yet? <laughs> Not so much. That, that never inspires anyone when you're, when you're talking about that kind of growth. But if you have a really big dream, you know, if you want to double your business in the next three to five years or something, that's something that it starts to make people, the, the idea with dreaming big is to get people out of their comfort zone. You're asking people to take a risk with you. You want to, you want to shake them up a little bit, make them uncomfortable with this vision. But that's, that's part of the process. If you left it there, that might be cruel or unfair. So keep listening. I'll say more to help you feel comfortable with this. But don't be afraid to ask a lot of people. Uh, this organization that, that uh, I have founded with a couple of other men over the last couple of years, you know, we thought about what we should call ourselves. Right now, after two years, we're in 16 different countries. All of those countries are in North America or in Europe. In a way, we are transatlantic leadership partners, <laughs> more so than global. But we really do believe that the potential for what we're doing has, has global reach. And so we've, you know, we've tried to think big, even with the name of our organization, Global Leadership Partners. So after you've established that dream, it's really important, you heard me talk about this a little bit before, it's really important that you're very clear why. Remember I was talking that even as individuals, you need to ask yourself why. And when you think about your vision, make sure that you have a very clear purpose associated with that vision. Make sure you understand the why. Let me just give you a very simple illustration. And once again, we're going to talk about Pampers diapers, okay? So let's say, you know, my vision is all about Pampers diapers. Well, think about Pampers. Think about what they do. Are you inspired yet? <laughs> <laughs> think about how they do it. Did that get you there? No, no. The science behind it, that doesn't do it? All right. Now think about why people buy Pampers. People buy Pampers because this precious creature who came into their lives, they want that precious creature to be healthy. They want the precious baby to be comfortable. They want the baby to sleep well at night so it grows in a healthy way. They want to sleep well at night. <laughs> hey, let's call it what it is here, right? But those are, you may still not be fully inspired, but you can understand how when you begin to understand the why behind a product or a vision, that that's when you can start to reach the point that you, you can touch the heart. And maybe, maybe find that spark that you can fan into a flame. Build hope. So that's our third step. And uh, here we have uh, a scene from the famous movie Braveheart, right? Mel Gibson, William Wallace was, uh, was leading the charge. And that is the role that you play as a leader sometimes. You need to lead that charge. Uh, you know, maybe on an athletic field in order to inspire others. You're that person who's playing with an injury just to, you know, to show your team that you're all in and leading them on to victory. So I want to share with you here a, a personal experience I had. I told you I lived in Bulgaria a few years ago. What I didn't tell you is that I lived in the part of Bulgaria that was the poorest and the most economically and socially challenged part of the country. I would meet Bulgarians as I traveled around and they would say, oh, uh, so where, you know, where do you, you're an American, where do you live? And I would say, I, I live in Vidin, Bulgaria. And they would always say the same thing. Why <laughs> would an American <laughs> businessman ever live in Vidin? And so anyway, sorry for the drama, but it was, uh, it was a difficult place. And I, I was sharing some leadership training there one time. And, uh, I remember in the back of the room, this man starts to raise his hand, and he, he said those words that you never want to hear when you're speaking. He said, you don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> he said, the people here are broken, and they are discouraged, and they have no hope that anything they could ever do is going to make a difference. And so, they just cross the days off their calendar. 
You know, they're really not, not inspired to go off and do anything. And I'm, I'm trying to keep the story short, but I'll just tell you that that was, that was jarring. That was, I, was, I was new there then. And that was really surprising to me as an American where, while America is not a perfect culture or country by any stretch, one characteristic you've probably seen in Americans is we really do genuinely believe, whether it's true or not, we do believe that if you work hard, you can make a difference. And if you work hard over time, you'll be rewarded for that. And uh, to, to, to parachute into a, a community where that was totally not true really was dis, uh, disturbing for me. And I, I tried to do as much as I could to, to give some of the people hope in that situation. One other, one other example that I want to give you about the importance of hope is I think this is just an amazingly powerful example. It's one that you know well, but maybe haven't really considered in this context. So it was, what, five or six years ago that we had that series of events that are now known as the Arab Spring. Right? Remember that? So the first thing that happened, if you remember, the first domino that fell was in Tunisia. First, let me just let me flash over to uh, Egypt. In Egypt... The broad population was not happy to have Mubarak as their leader, but they went about their business. They didn't think anything. He'd been the leader for what seemed decades, and they didn't think anything was going to change. And then what happened in Tunisia within a very short period of time? So a spark, a spark of sorts was lit, and within, I think it was about 17 days, they went from some initial incident to replacing their leader in Tunisia. What happened the next day in Egypt? What happened immediately? What happened was million, hundreds of thousands and soon millions of people were out on the streets and the public squares <coughs> clamoring, striving for change, change in their leadership, right? What happened? They had spent years under this leader inside their homes going about their business. And then within a very short period of time, something happened, and overnight, they're out in the public spaces. What happened? They had hope, right? That's the only thing that changed. All of a sudden, they thought, you know what? This can happen. It has happened, and it, it could happen here in Egypt. So, you know, as you think about being an inspirer, remember, I said a moment ago, ask people to take a risk on your vision. Ask them to get out of their comfort zone. Shake the foundations a little bit. But if you stopped there, it would be unfair. You also need to build their hope. Give them a reason to believe that that vision, if they, if they become all in with that vision, give them reason to believe that success can be achieved. Show care. Um, one of the other important aspects of, of being an inspirer is showing the care and compassion for those who are following. And I want to share here a couple of examples from my P&G experience. This may take just a moment, but I, I really want to make sure you understand the power of this. So I'll tell you a, a specific story. It relates to, uh, this was about, I don't know, eight or nine years ago. and. I had just completed a two-month leave of absence from Procter & Gamble. And I had come to Bulgaria for one week to that community that I mentioned, and then we spent another week doing some other things. But I, I had taken my two weeks, uh, my two months of leave of absence, and our policy as a company at that time was you could take two months every seven years. And that was it. So I took my leave of absence and my wife and I talked about it and you know, we really considered the future and we decided that we wanted to ask my leadership at Procter & Gamble if I could take one year leave of absence to continue the work that we started. And so remember, I had taken the leave of absence that I had and so according to the policy. And so I knew as I went and talked to my boss, there were two answers that were possible. One of those answers was, you have to be kidding. No, get back to work and let's talk in seven years. You know, about another two months. That's the policy here. We have rules. 
That's one answer that I could have gotten. The, the other answer, this is the one I was hoping for, the other answer is, well, I don't know, but maybe, you know, we'll see. You know, I'm not sure. It, it is outside of the policy you know, but, you know, let's, let's check. And here was the, here's the answer I got, okay? I went in, I was talking to this boss. It was a woman. It was not a woman that I would consider a friend. It was really more of a professional relationship. So I sat down in her office and I asked her this question, can I do this? And here was her, res her response, which I will never forget. She said, Todd, I know what you want to do. I know why, there's that word why, I know why you want to do it. And I'll tell you right here today that I commit to making this happen. I will help you make this happen. And I thought, wow. <laughs> you know, that wasn't on my list of, of possible answers. You know, didn't expect that one. And I, I'll tell you that, uh, I mean, I left her office that day learning something about how to inspire employees by showing care. Whether that employee has a health problem personally or in their family or some other personal need, you know, up to and including, you know, a desire to go serve and make a difference in another community. I learned something about the inspirational power of showing care. And let me tell you that if that boss, the next day, if that boss had said, Todd, do you see that brick wall? I would like you to run through it. You know what I would have done? <laughs> you know exactly what I would have done. <laughs> I, would have, I would have become very sore. <laughs> I would have tried to run through that wall. And, uh, you know, one other, one other thing that I'll mention to you is very quickly is I, uh, you know, it, it actually took a while to get final approval from the, uh, from the HR organization, but, you know, I, I did spend that year, so the company eventually uh, did agree for me to be able to do that. And then what happened within a few months after that, about the time we were getting ready to go, my wife was diagnosed with uh, a form of cancer. And uh, we thought, oh, you know, it's like a kick in the gut. What do, you, what do you do with that? You know, we have agreement to go be in Eastern Europe for a year. She has cancer. You know, what do we do? And by this time, I had a new boss. And that new boss, you know, when I shared this news with her, her immediate response to me at that time was, do what you need to do, you know, take, take your time, you know, get the health situation taken care of, and once you do that, when you have confidence to take this time away from work, then you can go do that. And once again, I thought, wow, <laughs> how, how affirming and how inspirational were these leaders who genuinely showed care for me when I had these moments of need. So I, I hope those, those examples will help you understand um, the power of this point. When you have somebody in your life, somebody who's following you, let's say, who has a need, I, I, I invite you, I implore you, go out of your way to show care for them in that moment, and you will, you will be on a path to inspiring them. Mother Teresa was a great example of that. Uh, she said, do not wait for leaders, do it alone, person to person. So I want to make the point here that sometimes when we think about inspiration, we think about Martin Luther King on the steps of the, you know, the uh, Lincoln Memorial speaking with passion to 100,000 people. You know, that's what we think of inspiration sometimes. And I want, to, I want to acknowledge that most of us will not be in that position, but most all of us can follow the model of Mother Teresa by inspiring people one person at a time. Next is placing trust. So as a leader, remember you are asking people to take a risk. You owe it to those people to place your trust in them to take on a significant part of responsibility to meet that vision. So let me give you a visual here to explain this. Remember early on, for the whole first session, I made this point. When you're a leader, you need to be a person of character, and the follower will reward you with their trust, right? 
Now what I'm saying is I'm flipping this around and I'm saying as a leader, you need to trust the follower. And what happens? Think about situations in your life when a leader has trusted you and given you some significant responsibility to meet a certain project or vision. How, is that, how have you responded to that? What does that make you feel when that happens? Hmm? Makes you feel significant. Worthy. Hmm? Worthy. Yeah, makes you feel worthy. Makes you feel affirmed. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you how it made me feel when I, early in my PG career, when I had a manager who trusted me more than I trusted me, I think, on a certain project. I thought, wow, I'm gonna prove that that person was right <laughs> in taking a risk on me. And I, I really was inspired in that moment to, you know, to, to do this. To perform, but not just to perform, perform with passion. Activate passion. All right? Okay, so we're going to take a moment now. We'll try to do this quickly if we can. I want to I do one more exercise before the evening is over. Okay? You guys look like you need some more energy. So here's what we're going to do. Go back into your groups again, and what I want you to do is I want you to be Dwight Eisenhower the day before D-Day. So you remember Eisenhower was the supreme commander of the Allied forces. He was going to send 150,000 troops to storm the beach on D-Day. Actually, 20,000 of them were dropped by parachute behind the enemy lines. The guys who were charging the beach were going to be facing a lot of, a lot of bullets. Many of them most certainly were going to die. And uh, his job, just to say a little bit more about D-Day, remember that uh, there were something like, what, eight to 10,000 planes and eight to 10,000 naval vehicles. I mean, this was the, the biggest amphibious assault in the history of the world. And he's, Eisenhower's the guy saying, go. <laughs> so he owes it to those troops to inspire them. And I want you in your small groups to come up with maybe three to five sentences that would be what you would say if you were Dwight Eisenhower the day before D-Day. Understand? All right. So try to, try to work through this quickly. Only three to five sentences, but keep this in mind. Here's the five elements, okay? So try to include each of these as you do it. All right, take it away. Anybody want to stand up and maybe with some inspirational sounding words? All right, so inspire us, please. All right, listen up, everyone. Prepare to be inspired. Right. Tomorrow we are facing the evil. Together we can beat it. See your future as you want it to be for new, better world. To, for our families, we can do it. Oh, all right. All right, who's next? Who's next? Just do it. We have a dream. Alright, there you go. Anybody else want to share? You guys want to share? Are you willing? Alright, go ahead. Go ahead. Stand up. Inspire. It's very short. Okay, this one. This one. But it's powerful. Um, because, of, uh, because of your courage and sacrifice, your children will tomorrow live in free and better world, and every man from now on will remember you. Woo! Who's next? Let's take just a moment. You guys want to share yours? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, yeah. All right, here we go. All right, listen, everyone. Um, so I'm not going to talk to you about tomorrow. I'm going to talk to you about the day after. Mm. So that's the day of our freedom. Mm. And you are the guys who are going to bring us to that day. Mm. And a lot of, uh, and all the whole, and the whole world is watching you and praying for you. Mm -hmm. 
and I want you to get me there and you want you, I want you to get my children there. I want you to get yourself there. Go. Oh, all right. All right. All right. I am almost as inspired as I could be, but I think there's just a little extra room. All right, go ahead. <laughs> uh, we are uh, uh, assuming that they are all men. They are okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dear brothers, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you know the feeling of freedom that you have, that your wife has, that your children have. Give that freedom to all that people tomorrow in that country, in the whole world. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you guys. I know I know that's difficult to do in the short time that I gave you, so thanks for having the courage to stand up and share. So here is the uh, here is the real speech. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers in arms on other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savages. But this is the year 1944. Much has happened since the Nazi triumphs of 1940-41. The United Nations have inflicted upon the Germans great defeat in open battle, Man to man. Our air offensive has seriously reduced their strength in the air and their capacity to wage war on the ground. Our home front has given us an overwhelming superiority in weapons and munitions of war and placed at our disposal great reserves of trained fighting men. The tide has turned. The free men of the world are marching together to victory. I have full confidence in your courage devotion to duty and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck, and let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. Okay. So, the last thing I wanted to share with you on this very quickly, uh, I'm going to do it so I can turn it over to Ron here and he'll finish this up for the evening. The really uh, interesting thing is, not surprisingly, that each of these five elements that we talked about are evident here. So we had a, a dream, a big dream, destruction of the German war machine. Um, you know, we're talking about liberty-loving people everywhere marching with you, and, and the hopes and prayers. All of this explains the why. Building hope. Remember what he said. A lot has changed. This is. These are not the same. Enemies that we faced a few years ago, showing care. Hey, let's admit, these guys, this is going to be hard. These guys are going to fight savagely against you. And then placing trust. What does it say in that last paragraph? You can't say it any more clearly than that. I have full confidence. All right. So I don't, we don't hold this up to be like the gold standard of inspiration. We all know there's some things he could do differently, but... Uh, we wanted just to show you the, the way this actually happened historically and to point out that it, it really does include these five elements that we talked about. With that, I'm turning it over to Ronald. Okay. So we're going to go on to the D, develop capability the builder. Um, one thing that we know about the very best leaders, they're always learning, is they know what they know what they used to know won't get them to where they need to be tomorrow. And as leaders, you're all, and that's why I think everybody's in this room anyway. Y'all are leaders. You know, if you're going to come to some place where you're going to learn, get a few nuggets, you're going to be a better leader. So 
So what Roosevelt says is when you're asked, when you are asked if you can do a job, tell them certainly I can and get busy and find out how to do it. It's really a, just a picture of a positive attitude. Uh, you know, and I, I think I said earlier when I started with Ford, I was an engineer. And then, then when I left, I was an executive director. So I started out managing myself and then ended my career with about 4,000 employees. Um, but I remember along the way, I'd be asked to go do a job. And, and, and inside, I didn't really think I could do that job. Because it might be that there, a different part of engineering that I've never seen before. It might be in operations, and now I'm an engineer. I certainly remember the day I went to operations where, and left engineering. This is what I had to think about. Sir, I can do it. I would say, I can do it. Maybe I was motivated because of the promotion, but in the end, you just get busy and figure it out. Martin Luther King said, our success can be measured by how well we shape and grow and assure the success of the next generation. That's certainly a long-term thinking. He's not thinking about next week or tomorrow or next month or even next year. It speaks to thinking about the next generation. And as leaders, we should be teaching and mentoring people for the next generation. So how do we develop capacity? Um, th this is not rocket science here, very simple. Um, learning resources in all spheres. As we go through life, experience, you would say experience has taught them the most in this room. <clears throat> yeah, I'm sorry. We're getting a little more courage now. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably true of most people. Um, training, not so much. Uh, mostly because I don't think we have time to train. We're all busy. So I think you can't do as much training as you like, so it's probably 10%. But the others, that speaks to mentors and coaches. Uh, does, does everybody here have a mentor or a coach in their life? A mentor? Just a few people? Yeah. You know, that's one of the most valuable ways to learn. I can think back when I was in my 20s, I found a mentor who was in his 30s. When I was in my 30s, I found him. Now, I didn't always, sometimes I can keep the same mentor, but if I'm moving to a different <coughs> state or a different country, then I'm kind of, I might lose my mentor, and I always find somebody 10 years older than me that's been through what I've been through or what I'm getting ready to go through because those conversations, although they might not be uh, as often as I like or as much detail, those conversations have been extremely valuable to me throughout my life. Cheryl Sandberg. Anybody know who, who she is? Yeah. <laughs> everybody knows. Everybody knows. Is she working in Google? Facebook. Yeah. Facebook. Facebook. Oh, Google. No, it's Facebook. 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 Absolutely. Are you sure? Facebook. Facebook. Yeah, 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 so number two, when it comes to developing capability, when you're in a leadership position, you often have opportunity to assign a job. Doesn't it make a lot of sense to help people fit into a job that, that matches their skill set? Have you ever been asked to do a job that didn't match your skill set? Anybody? <laughs> so how, how much fun was that? Yeah. Was it a little bit discouraging? <laughs> a little bit difficult? As leaders, it's all, and, and, and there was a time when I was younger, uh, my company used to try to put people in all kinds of jobs they were not familiar with because we were around them. And I remember when I started with Ford, I started with 20 other engineers about the same time. And the company decided they would take five of these engineers that were gonna, who, who have degrees in analysis, and in, in chemistry, and electrical engineering, and put them out in operations and have them manage people. How do you think that worked out? Yeah. Nice. Of those five people that went out to manage people, when I started, how many of those people do you think still work for Ford? None. Zero. None of them lasted two more years. 
They were discouraged. They didn't like what they were doing. They were engineers. It was just a bad idea. Uh, I remember they asked me to do that back then, and I said, no, this is not a fit for me. You know, and I think I was just exercising a little bit of wisdom, or maybe I counseled one of my mentors. Uh, so, so fitting people into the proper jobs makes all makes very much sense. So leaders break down barriers. So I was going to use the example today, I'm going to give you a brand new Mustang GT. Will anybody be excited about that? <laughs> What do you want? <laughs> you want a Mercedes? No, no. It's a brand new Ferrari Trofeo FA. <laughs> Go for that. That's the top of the range. That's, that's what will inspire you. <laughs> that, that's the top of the range. Please move. That's the top of the range. Yeah, you can go there for one minute. F8 Ceibuto. That's the, uh, the brand new. F8. Yeah, that's that, that, that was last week in Geneva. Yeah, so we both was on this road, what happened? Yeah, well, uh, it was the four-wheel drive, so you should drive. <laughs> no problem. But, but let's agree, it would be probably helpful to have this one in front of it, as we're going. So, so just as an example, leaders break down barriers. They'll move things out of the way. And, and, and I was listening to a, a presentation the other day about project management. And in big companies, you have project managers. So they're usually not, a, they usually don't have very many, much rank or position, but they have big responsibility to bring a project home. And the one thing that we always do in big companies, project managers, after they get their project ready and we all agree to it, the senior leadership signs off on the project. And the senior leadership ensures that the entire organization knows they're behind the project. So what does that do for the project manager? Raise the barriers. There are no more barriers. Mm -hmm. Also, the other thing the senior leaders do is bring everybody into our room once a week and say, how's the progress going? Is anybody going to say, well, we didn't do what we said we'd do? No. They're going to they're gonna do the job. That, that's what I mean by break down barriers in business. So, execute with excellence. Oh, yeah. So this is more the management side of it. You know, it's, it's a bit boring. But leaders, gotta have, at some point, you need to be managers because the work does have to be done. So, um, Levine John says, says that he's an entrepreneur, and maybe you've heard him, maybe you haven't, but he started a lot of businesses and, 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 and made pretty successful businesses. Success doesn't necessarily come from breaking through innovation, but the flawless execution, a great strategy alone, won't win a game, a battle. The win comes from blocking and tackling. And this resonates with me a bit because I would be called a manufacturing guy. I spent most of my career having a, having a factory that produced results every day. We didn't necessarily innovate anything, but at the end of the day, if we had to ship 2,000 engines, we had to ship 2,000 engines. <laughs> because guess what if we didn't ship 2,000 engines? The ship doesn't wait. No cars. No cars. No money. Well, <laughs> what do you think life would be like say, if I'm a plant manager and I'm making engines and every day I'm short 100 engines? How long would I have a job? Seven days. <laughs> what? Seven, seven days. Seven days? You think I get all seven days? That's about right. About seven days is all you get. That's the blocking and tackling. Because if you don't ship those last 100 engines, that's 100 cars that don't are made, and the, the company makes money when that car sells. And, and if it's a Ferrari F8, yeah, how much money do you think we make? That's $250,000. $250,000? Yeah, it's a good car. Anyway, <laughs> so blocking and tackling. So Thomas Edison says vision without execution is hallucination. So we have to get the work done. This is fundamental. So how do we do that? How do we get the work done? So we create the, the basic business management. We create strategy and plans to reach the vision. Anybody ever heard of SMART objectives? So it's S is for specific, measurable, achievable, realistic. I use the word relative. But realistic is good too. And then what's the last one? Time bound. And that just makes sense. If we're going to give someone an objective, it's going to be very specific. People need to know what they're supposed to do. 
needs to be measurable so that if it's measurable, we know what kind of progress we're making. And we are meeting the time, the time boundary. Um, achievable, it needs to be something you can really do. Um, a few times in my life, I've been given an objective that might be impossible. But be careful with that. Oftentimes, people think something's impossible and it's not. <clears throat> so it's just stretch yourself. Always stretch yourself. Because there's typically a way to get to something where it might have been considered impossible in the past, but with new technology, better thinking, creativity, connecting, synthesizing, boom, the impossible becomes possible. The reason I use the word relative versus realistic because if it's relative, it should be relative to our objectives and our vision. The work we do can be easily connected with our employees. If it's relative to what we do and what, what our purpose, there's a lot more motivation. And then time bound, we need to get things done on time. Establish accountability. Another top one. What does it feel like to be held accountable? Does that sound good? Does that feel good? <laughs> Be held accountable. Yeah, that's good. Some people kind of r rush away from accountability. I can see this group. You, know, you understand it's important. We have to be accountable uh, for the work we do. And what that could look like if you were a leader or a manager <coughs> is just having a weekly one on one meeting and, and talk about hey, how's it going? Is it coming on time? Is it going okay for you? Do you have a barrier I can work with? And so, if you, as a leader, if I'm asking, if, can, hey, can I help you once a week? Yeah, I'm holding people accountable, but I'm, I'm lending out a hand that I care at the same time. And if I do that, the accountability, the accountability feels better. And it is better. Agility. Here's what I think about agility. And it being a manufacturing guy, there's always plan A. This is how we're going to operate and make the world run. To the, but I always have a plan B. Because sometimes plan A hits a, hits a roadblock or, or gets stopped or has a flat tire and we can't go. So, so always think about, you know, don't always have one path to success. Always have something in the background that you can have to show agility if things get tough. Persistence, drive action, deliver results. For me personally, and, and with my personality style, persistence is what I really do well. I always think about the athlete. Sometimes you see an athlete who, who may not be the most gifted athlete. He may not have these unbelievable magical skills, but for some, some way, somehow, that athlete always wins. You know, you ever, you ever seen, you know what I'm talking about with athletes? That's just, just this hard work and persistence. And I think the same thing works in business. You know, hard work and persistence will pay off Oftentimes, when you all don't have the talent and the skills, that make sense. Okay, so last but not least is replicate success. If we get all this work done and we go so far, leaders need to replicate. Replicate what we do well, maybe work on what we don't do well, but it's the sustainer. It's putting processes, systems, and controls in place that will sustain the business. And how do you pronounce this? Tadashi Yanai. Tadashi Yanai. You were talking about smart. Yeah, smart. Yeah. <laughs> this might be the guy we're talking about. Smart guy. Right? <laughs> he came from up the biggest hill in Japan. Did he? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the biggest part of my job is to quickly develop successors around the world. I'm working to develop new business leaders in the company. And I think there's a time when you get to that position, this is exactly what you do. Not spending so much time working on what the daily activity of the world, you're making sure people are ready to put the business forward. All right, so now, one more last assignment. How much time do we have? 30 seconds. <laughs> let's, let's just give them a, a minute or two. Well, we, you know, this won't, this won't take long, but you have this, I think, a piece of paper when you wrote down your purpose earlier. Yeah, so at the bottom of that handout page, you can see space to do this exercise, and you don't need to fully fill this in, just maybe make some notes to yourself. Okay, yeah, so, what, so here's the assignment, and it's going to sit out there, what are the two things you do best? It's always easy to start with what I do best. 
uh, of, of, and what are the things do I need to improve? And here are the things. So, are you a great vision caster? Then you write that down. Write that down. Okay, for those of you who have that task completed, why don't you take your other page that looks like this, a personal development plan, and at this time of night, we're not going to ask you to fill it all out. We are, we are going to ask you to, to look into that very first column. Just focus here. And why don't you write down two or three areas in which you would like to grow based on the discussion that we had this evening. One thing that you may want to add here for number one is I'm going to complete my personal mission statement. I, I hope all of you... What's that? Yeah, this week, this month. Tonight. Tonight? No, no, not tonight. But I will complete, you know, make a commitment to yourself. Hold yourself accountable to complete that. We said that was the, the starting place for a leader. And then maybe one or two areas from the other content in which you would like to grow. And you don't need to fill out any more this evening. Just start with that. Okay. <clears throat> Why don't I... Uh, if I can have you look up here for just a moment, we'll, we'll finish things up for the evening. <laughs> so I, I think most of you have had a chance to fill in at least the first column. And what I want to suggest to you is the power of using a coach or a mentor to think through the rest of this page. And Nolan and Sandra... <laughs> I was fishing for it there, thank you. Noah and Sandra uh, and their focus organization have a lot of experience. They've coached, I think Nolan was saying, probably a couple hundred or more people on how to think through some of these things, how to approach this kind of work in the area of personal development. So if any of you would like to take them up on their offer, they are willing to meet with you. And uh, I think they can just reach out to you. And they can indicate. Ah, that's right. Uh, you can reach out to them afterwards. You can also make a note on the third handout page if you want to pull that up. So on that third page, we'll give you we'll give you time in a moment to fill that out. But right now, I just want you to see that if you would like to get some coaching in this area, that you can make note of it there. Okay. So let me. Uh, can I ask you to all look up here for a second? I should have never shown you that third page. <laughs> Away you go. All right. Give me 60 more seconds of your time, okay? I just want to say thank you uh, for coming this evening. More than that, thank you for staying this evening as we've been here together in this small room for quite a while now. And I want to remind you of a quote from a famous author who once said, nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. So I know that if enthusiasm is a key ingredient in making great things happen, I know I am expecting great things from the people in this room as you walk this path of using leadership to achieve the success that you will seek in your lives. So I, I want to thank you for your active participation and your enthusiasm. Uh, I know one of my goals this evening was to have some fun, and I know I have. I hope you have, too. You've made it fun for me, and I, I really enjoyed the opportunity to, to get to know you through our dialogue throughout the evening. So thanks again for that. Thanks to Nolan and Sandra for inviting us to, uh, to join you here in Zagreb to have this time together. And I want to say that uh, if you'd like to continue our relationship past this four hours this evening, Here's how you can reach us. I'll get out of the way. <laughs> so so uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, of course. Uh, oh, and by the way, on Facebook, I invite you to, to take a look at our Global Leadership Partners site and uh, maybe like it. And as you do that, you're not going to get spammed. But what you will see on your feed from time to time is information on where we're going to be and when. So maybe we'll have a chance to come back and, and see you all again in the future. So uh, that's, some, uh, that's some ways that you can keep in touch with us. 
Uh, I know Ron and I will look forward to meeting with at least a few of you over the next couple days. If there are others who would like to sign up to meet with us on Friday and Saturday, I know there's still a, a couple more time slots available to do that. And uh, with that, I just want to say thanks again and look forward to seeing you guys in the future. All the best to you. Thank you.